EU Chamber of Commerce in China and who is absolutely fantastic when it comes to his Mandarin speaking skills, quite impressive, um, I might add. We also have Carl Fay, Professor of International Business of Finland's Aalto University of Business, joining us online there. And Joël Rue is the president of the think tank and independent dialogue platform, The Bridge Tank. So welcome to all of our panelists online and seated here at the Boa Forum in Hainan. So first off, let's hear our opening remarks from Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Dmitro Kuleba. Dear ladies and gentlemen, last year, economic disruptions due to COVID-19 pandemic led to an unprecedented collapse of international trade. Demand and supply shocks that originated in major economies quickly spread globally, causing some disproportionate economic calamities in developing countries. Paradoxically, it is exactly international trade that now plays a key role in fostering economic recovery. The key question now is whether countries will be able to balance the speed and scope of the recovery with inclusive and sustainable social and economic growth. Multiple challenges arising from the pandemic require countries all over the globe to turn to an intensified international cooperation, using all available bilateral and regional mechanisms to achieve greater synergy. True resilience will be achieved not by closing borders, but by diversifying origins and destinations. As a strategically important logistical hub between Asia and Europe, Ukraine is eager to contribute to developing such resilient trade multilateralism. Ukraine is currently rapidly developing and upgrading its transport infrastructure in order to boost competitiveness of multimodal container transport connections on Asia, Western Europe, Asia route. Boosting transit flows means constructing ports, terminals, elevators, rolling stock for transportation of agricultural products, cold storage, warehousing and other. We are open for public-private partnerships and other types of cooperation to foster such interaction. Ukraine is known for its mighty agricultural sector. We are the world's third grains exporter. Ukrainian agricultural products have won confidence in many parts of the world, particularly in Asia. Ukraine is able to double the volume of agricultural production, but this would require more investment. A few words on our advanced IT sector, which has recently surprised even ourselves in Ukraine with the pace of its growth. Ukrainian IT exports have grown exponentially even in 2020. By the way, this was well noted by many Asian companies. I'm sure this boom will continue for the coming decade and foreign partners can become part of this great success. One other sector we currently have a priority for is alternative energy sources such as green hydrogen. The European Union defined Ukraine as a priority partner in supplying this new type of energy. I believe hydrogen can well become the new black in energy markets. This is a type of investment that can bring some enormous returns later and that is why we are now actively developing relevant infrastructure. The President of Ukraine has launched a massive nationwide infrastructure renovation program called the Great Construction. Needless to say, opportunities for investors and contractors are enormous. Furthermore, Ukraine is currently pursuing a large national privatization program, which can be of a great interest for Asian investors as well. Concluding my remarks, I would like to underline that Ukraine welcomes efforts of Asian states to structure and liberalize trade. Excessive protectionism restrains global economic recovery. Comprehensive recovery requires cooperation-oriented and fair trade policies. Ukraine fully supports such a vision and is eager to contribute to global post-pandemic recovery by developing mutually beneficial and resilient trade links and projects. I thank you for your attention. So we just heard there from Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba making a pitch there for trade and investment in Ukraine and talking about the resiliency of trade links 
uh, across the Eurasian continent. Uh, let's now have some opening remarks from Mr. Liu Hualong. He's the chairman of China Poly Group. Liu Dong, your team. Uh Every year, it's investing has been threatened by the pandemic as well as the great economic against the challenges. But once again, because of the, uh, the shared community of uh, shared economic community and cooperation is the most important to chop the water from that region uh, of the pandemic. And also, Poly Group has been. And in 2020, in 2020, yeah, Seeing that in terms of trade circulation, we are full particular insights of thinking. So I'd like to share them with you. First of all, BRI has provided China as well as relevant countries a very sound platform for trade education. China has made the proposal of BRI and with efforts made by multilateral participants that have reached the results. During the pandemic, thanks to the platform by BRI, we could stand more closely to each other. And that platform has played a significant role in boosting economic growth. The second takeaway is that our cooperation against the pandemic is the reciprocal during the pandemic, we've been looking at how we overcome the pandemic and are our particular touch point and idea. And of course, that's we place the pandemic in the has been working with partners globally on a comprehensive basis to share with them our experiences and practices in safeguarding the pandemic, so that together, also during the pandemic, we have ended our partners' available help, such as Pakistan, Africa, and Russia, with necessary equipment, such as thermostats, such as thermometers, such as masks, Group, commitment, and we stand for the hardship to make sure that we are obligated to give our comforts. During this time, we have put together a sense of what are on contract time and contractual terms. And the first we take from that to make that trade facilitated, we should establish a resilient supply chain which does uh, based on all trends in business and that in promoting trade facilitation. Poly has been making sure that the 
that is that is by products, that stabilize products price in the market, as well as the transformation upgrading of the supply chain. Actually, concerning of social economic developments, how the group is actually making an effort and a lot of extension to my welcome to with us anytime you can. Together, we can see how we strike out, uh, making, forward, making us go forward in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. facilitate unimpeded trade uh, around the world, that cooperation when it comes to mutually fighting the pandemic is essential to spur our global economic recovery with China Ponly Group also sharing experiences with businesses around the world to fight the pandemic. Building trust is the bedrock of, China's, of China Ponly Group, especially during the pandemic, honoring its contracts with businesses around the world, and the importance of resilient supply chains with China Ponly Group providing that stability in price uh, and supply when it comes to uh, its products and services around the world. So Mr. Liu, thank you so much for your comments on that. Okay, so let's get our discussion started in terms of how we can speed up our global trade recovery. And let me pose the first question to Secretary General Besanov. Um, Mr. Besanov, I want you to set the stage for us first in terms of how have you seen the pandemic importing specifically the transportation of goods across Eurasia? Ah, the wonders of technology. Let me see when my voice can actually reach Mr. Besanov. Can we get Mr. Besanov on the line? Yes. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for invitation and opportunity to participate in such significant event as BVA conference. So, in fact, what we observe right now is combination of cyclic economic crisis, which was predicted long before, and pandemic crisis, which became a surprise for the global economy. And this is really beneficiary for the container transportation. In crisis conditions, the traffic would just decrease. 2017, 2018 were the years of faster growth of rail freight transit in uh, Europe and Asia. Three time growth in 2017 to 2016, and one and a half times growth in 2080. Uh, then it slowed down in 2090, and further slowdown was predicted. But the pandemic change the situation to the better. It's a very strange, but uh, thanks um, to a broken supply chain and construction of new ones, what we observe now in extensive growth, especially of rail transportation. In the first quarter on this year, the growth of transported rail uh, freight in transit from Asia to Europe and back is plus 70 percent to be the same period in uh, 2020. The figures of 2020 also showed a significant uh, surplus. Will this elevated volumes and positive dynamic be kept in the future? This depends on our actions today, as economic background will surely not allow to maintain such growth by itself. Okay, uh, Mr. Bestanov, thank you for that. Jens, I wanna ask you, maybe you can add a little bit more color in terms of what Mr. Bestanov has said. We saw that uh, quite strong bounce back in terms of rail freight across the Eurasian continent, maybe counterintuitive to what we would have imagined given the disruptions uh, from the pandemic. We, we know the China-Europe freight, uh, freight line has been absolutely essential in terms of promoting trade between the two sides. Uh, last year, it's done quite well. So maybe talk to us a little bit more in terms of how the China-EU Express really uh, help to stabilize global supply chains, if you will, um, and perhaps add Maersk's perspective on this. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? I seem to be struggling a little bit. 
Yeah. Okay. Maybe you can put your microphone a little bit closer to, to you so yeah. we can hear you okay. There we go. There we go. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and indeed, uh, we think that uh, the rail product to Europe uh, is uh, a fantastic uh, uh, solution. And we have indeed seen uh, uh, very uh, rapid growth. Uh, the advantages that it provides, amongst others, is that it's, it's about two times as fast as uh, ocean shipping. And it comes at about a third or a fifth of the cost of uh, uh, air transport. Uh, that being said, uh, it is necessarily uh, a niche product. When you looked at, at, at the dimensions of it, on our very largest uh, container ship sailing between China and Europe, you can put 20,000 containers. On a train, you can put 100, so you do the math. I mean, it's a factor uh, uh, 200 or so in terms of how many containers you can put on a train and put on a, uh, uh, on, on, on a container ship. But it doesn't mean that it's not a very important uh, product. We don't see it as direct competition to shipping, but we see it as a very welcome supplement that we are seeing uh, uh, growing very fast right now. And I think in, in, in particular, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the rail link demonstrated its uh, value. Uh, one of the consequences of the closed borders was that we saw a very sharp reduction in air traffic. And a lot of, of the passenger flights have also been uh, carrying cargo. And in particular, in you, of the very high demand for, for Chinese produced PPE in, 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 in Europe, uh, the rail links became uh, very, very uh, uh, important. Uh, so I think when you look at it together, air and shipping, uh, you know, rail has become an indispensable uh, a third link and we are very happy to see it, it uh, developing uh, so positively. Now in terms of future development, I think that, that there are multiple factors playing in here. Uh, rail has, of course, also to a certain uh, 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 extent been helped by the fact that, uh, as I mentioned before, air traffic more or less collapsed uh, 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 last year, but also that we have seen in the second half of the year that freight prices for shipping has increased, which make it more competitive relative uh, to, uh, to shipping to, to, to use the rail. And then, of course, the third fact that uh, the rail is also dependent on very generous government subsidies, and it's, of course, also a question of whether government will be willing to continue to invest so heavily uh, into to, to that thing. So there are many factors at play at the same time, uh, but certainly at most, uh, we are very optimistic and we continue to launch uh, new services, uh, if not every week, then every month. Thank you. Yeah, Jens, let me quickly follow up on that. So what do you think is the growth potential then between China, Europe, rail? Are you able to give us maybe a ballpark figure and then uh, it seems like you're, you're optimistic about this rail route. What might perhaps be some of the challenges from getting that rail route developing a little bit faster? Um, I, I think, of course, as mentioned before, there are challenges related to pricing and uh, also in terms of subsidies. Uh, I think in, in, in some of the rail corridors, government subsidies might be almost as much as half of the operation cost. And of course, over time, that's not sustainable. So you need to be, uh, become better at driving down the operational cost and make it you know, commercially viable uh, 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 in itself. That would be very important. And then of course, there are capacity uh, issues also. And I have to say, I'm not an expert on that, mm. but there will of course be limits uh, to how many trains you can put on a set of tracks. And also that you have these nodes where you are doing transshipment of containers uh, for example, on the border uh, between China and, and Kazakhstan, that you make sure that there is the adequate facility to handle rapidly uh, growing uh, uh, volumes of containers. But I think if there's one thing that's interesting there, that is to see how well China actually coped with explosive growth in Chinese ports following China's uh, accession to the WTO mm. in 2001. I think everyone was actually a bit surprised by China's ability to bring new capacity online very, very fast to, to cater for that growth. So I think that's actually one of the areas where China has a real strength and, and will be able to, to bring on capacity relatively fast. Got it. Okay, thanks for that, Jens. Um, just some simple housekeeping. Uh, to our guests online, so Professor Fei, uh, Mr. Besanov, and Joel, anytime you want to jump in, all right, in terms of the perspectives and thoughts that you've heard and you want to add on to the conversation, feel free to raise your hand and then I'll call on you, okay? If you wanna jump in onto the conversation, we can see you quite clearly here. You're on a big screen here. So just raise your hand if you wanna jump into what one of our panelists has said. Uh, Giuseppe, let me come to you right now because this is what I think is maybe 
um, something that we don't talk about enough, but we definitely deserve more attention because you had the UN's migration agency here in China. And we know the BRI has five major areas of cooperation, right? Unimpeded trade is one, financial integration, for example, infrastructure, connectivity, policy coordination. Uh, the fifth one being, I mean, this is not in order, but people to people connectivity, really important, right? I mean, we talk about often trade flowing across borders, goods, capital flowing across border, but people so essential behind this trade. So how did the pandemic really impact cross-border mobility, I think? Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting IOM, the UN Migration Agency, to this conversation. Uh, in, indeed, in a globalized world, um, more and more we see the need to, 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 to have capitals and, and goods and services that move along, and, and they move along with people. And so rightly so, people-to-people -people connectivity is one of them the five key priority areas for cooperation in the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is very relevant in a number of ways. You have more than 130 countries and organizations that have already uh, accepted to be part of this initiative. And so if you count the total population of these nations, they nearly account for 70% of the global population which then in uh, GDP terms account for uh, over 50% of the global GDP. Um, if you consider that one in seven persons around the world is a migrant, because currently it's estimated that we have about a billion migrants in the world, that just tells you two thirds of migrants um, are part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So there are tremendous opportunities, there are tremendous challenges, and this pandemic in fact uh, presented itself um, as three interlocking crises on people on the move, as primarily a health crisis, a socioeconomic crisis, but also as a protection crisis, because has had a disproportionate effect on the most vulnerable. So what does this then mean in terms of the potential for the Belt Road Initiative? I think probably more and more attention needs to be paid at the, the capacity of people to contribute uh, in terms of uh, investing, in terms of trade, in terms of economic growth, um, within the Belt Road Initiative. And this can be done in form of international migration. So you may well have, for example, foreign workforce that uh, uh, joins uh, infrastructure development projects, but then you, you do have issues associated with migrant integration. How do migrants settle in and integrate with it, uh, the host country and host communities? You do have issues related to internal migration. How opportunities that uh, come up in connection with an investment infrastructure project, what type of jobs and skills requirement to generate for the local workforce, which may move in search of this opportunity. Then you also have intra-regional mobility issues, which are very relevant. We're talking about Central Asia, historically, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, and other countries have seen major intra-regional mobility. So what does that mean? And how that can contribute to the development of BRI initiatives? And last but not least, we also consider reverse migration. Whereas, and we know also here in China with the thousand skills and thousand talent program and others, how important sometimes is to bring back elements of the diaspora and how they can contribute back to the development initiatives in their own countries. So there's then a lot to say, and I'm glad that people to people exchange and connectivity come into the picture. But yes, indubitably, um, not only has been the pandemic presented itself as an health, as a socioeconomic, and as a protection crisis, but it's been largely a human mobility crisis. Mm. Um, I'm glad to see that goods have been uh, able to move probably more than ever before as a result of a nearly complete halt of international business travel. Um, slowly, uh, we expect the, the air, air communication to, to restart. We expect also that um, people will continue to, 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 to move uh, within and across borders. And, uh, and this then brings me to something that perhaps we can touch on later what's going to be the future of mobility after this pandemic. Um, so in, in terms of the future of mobility after the pandemic, uh, Giuseppe, what about e-commerce? I mean, we've seen explosive e-commerce as well because of the pandemic. Does that impact migration as all, uh, at all? Can we draw a link there? Maybe uh, we'll see less migration as people are able to be a bit more flexible in terms of staying home from e-commerce. Absolutely, but you also can consider that e-commerce platforms and applications uh, sometimes rely largely on internal migration. You have many people, we even heard in the session I attended before, on a large movement of people moving from rural to urban areas in search of jobs. And often uh, where we see the use of uh, e-commerce apps largely in use in large urban settings. So then is an issue of uh, internal mobility. But also 
e-commerce means digitalization. Digitalization is now being used also by border processing, custom processing. So there are important implications of digitalization in the, in the global border and health infrastructure. So in my mind, it's an issue of skills, skills development. Mm. Um, we, we were talking about the Belt Road Initiative. You have countries participating in DRI that are rapidly aging societies and uh, soon will face in the next two to three decades uh, large uh, uh, gaps in the workforce and jobs and skills. And then you have, for example, countries in Africa that have uh, a major youth population in search of employment opportunities. So it will be very important to see how the Belt Road Initiatives, looking at future of mobility, can create opportunities, for example, for uh, job creation in uh, BRI developing partner countries and countries that are in demand of new jobs and new skills. So it's all the area of skills development that I think would be part and parcel of the future of mobility. Mm. Uh, speaking of digitization, Professor Fay, let me come to you. From your perspective, how have you seen the digitization of the Belt and Road Initiative really push forward economic cooperation across the Eurasian landmass? or just global trade, global economy overall? Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, a couple things. I think one of the real interesting things that uh, we've seen uh, when we talk about digitalization uh, is that, for example, Estonia um, has developed an interesting concept uh, called e-residency, where you can uh, start a business in Estonia without ever going there at all, um, doing it totally online. Um, and this is great as we you know, have challenges with travel um, in uh, COVID times. But it's also great in non-COVID times, for example, for companies from Asia that are trying to enter the European Union to sell, for people that want to be more mobile, for freelancers and a variety of different people. And I think this is one of the reasons that Estonia has been able to see actually a growth in exports um, during the COVID period in 2020 of 0.47%. Uh, I think that there are other interesting examples as well we can see from um, e-commerce, which has you know, been a real important part of the Belt and Road Initiative through the uh, Global Silk Road. Uh, for example, uh, I've been really interested to, to see um, what the uh, EWTP, uh, this organization started by Jack Ma, um, and pulling together different efforts of different organizations has done. It's just one example of that. Um, they've helped uh, uh, small SMEs um, in uh, Rwanda uh, to get better skills and better access uh, to global trade. One example of this would be uh, Rwanda's Gorilla Coffee, which pulls together uh, small uh, farmers um, and helps them through uh, free trade to get, uh, uh, fair trade, I'm sorry, to get uh, some profits back to them. And they were having, uh, doing quite well before the COVID times, but then they ran into problems uh, in uh, uh, the spring of 2020 when companies not only stopped buying as much of their coffee, but they also stopped buying because they were worried if they could ever receive the supplies due to uh, transportation issues. And so EWTP helped them improve these shipping issues. Uh, they taught them uh, how to do, uh, for example, live streaming in China in collaboration with uh, Alibaba's Tmall. And uh, Alibaba ran a number of events uh, pulling together celebrities and leaders of Alibaba and the UN and other organizations. And the first such of these events, Gorilla Coffee actually sold out totally just in the online event. So those are uh, two examples that uh, we can see how things are affected. Mm. Joel, how about you join into the conversation as well in terms of what you've heard so far, what do you agree with, what do you disagree with? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Michael, and I'm very happy to be back to, uh, to uh, Boao, even if uh, virtually this time uh, I started uh, participating the, this great forum four years ago. And at that time, the, the, the panel was moderated by another great anchor from CGTN, my friend and companion in arms, uh, Yang Ray, uh, whom I'm giving a tribute uh, today, Michael. I'm sure you, you join me uh, to, to say hi to Yang Ray. Uh, okay. No, I agree with a lot of things. Uh, I, I think this year gave a sense of two things, of acceleration and planning. Acceleration in trade, uh, uh, in, in, in fostering new ways of trade, you know, the, the, the current trade uh, has had hiccups, uh, but new ways of trade. So we've discussed about, uh, about the trains, the Eurasian trains, but what is noticeable is the RCEP treaty got accelerated. It is a treaty that got negotiated for a long time. It got, it got clinched uh, towards the end of the year. Planning as well. We all know that the trade of today results from investment of yesterday. 
and uh, the investment of today uh, means the trade of tomorrow and uh, uh, as a european i can only salute uh, the fact that there has been an agreement in principle for a eu uh, china uh, investment agreement both on services so it is concerned of course but partly as well on, on industry and here i would want to comment on what's been said on the uh, euro asian train or rail uh, rail freight so far uh, a lot of uh, trade on this route has happened uh, kind of one way mostly from Asia to Europe for obvious reasons. I think we have to make this more optimal and we have to help balance the trade. Uh, Europe can export a lot of things. We've been lucky to hear the, 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 the minister from Ukraine. Ukraine uh, can export a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, services. We've known that, but can export a lot of goods. They can export uh, uh, agricultural goods, uh, uh, processed uh, food, so can Europe. We can export uh, some uh, types of advanced technologies, uh, equipments. Uh, so I think we ought to work on balancing, uh, balancing this trade, I think is, is an important uh, issue. Two more points I would want to add in kind of reaction, but again, moving into this direction of planning the future. Uh, I would say that Energy structure are changing. We all know that we have energy transition. And here is somewhere where the Belt and Road Initiative can play a role. We've heard uh, mention, uh, mention about hydrogen. Hydrogen has two champions in the world. One is China and the other one is European countries uh, or Asia at large. Uh, Japan is part of that uh, as well. Uh, I think we ought to have more cooperations in terms of research, in terms of joint endeavors, and in terms of exchange of goods, because the hydrogen chain, the hydrogen value chain is multiple, is complex, and uh, China, the Chinese industry has some advantages in its equipment, so does uh, the German and the French industry. So I think in terms of trade of goods, and these are, again, uh, heavy equipments that can circulate very easily uh, across uh, across the Eurasian uh, continent. Last but not least, in terms of value chain, um, these new energies, uh, and namely uh, hydrogen, can uh, transform uh, shipping. They can transform uh, more and more uh, shippers are considering having hydrogen uh, vessels, hydrogen fleet. And last but not least, one another point I want uh, I want to uh, to add. Africa was mentioned. Many African countries are part, uh, are intrigued with the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the WTO for the first time in its history has an African director general, a lady, uh, and she's willing to promote uh, trade uh, within Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world. And I think that here, Europe on the one hand, uh, China, on the other hand, and Asia more generally, have a, a card to play to help uh, the African continent open to, to, to trade. And again, through a balanced trade. Uh, so far, the Belt and Road Initiative on the African continent has contributed a lot in terms of investment. Trade should be more. And my very last point is that the investment that has occurred on the continent, on the African continent, through the Belt and Road Initiative, was rather for infrastructure. So no, I'm not saying that uh, Africa is enough equipped with infrastructure. infrastructure. Africa needs more infrastructure, but it has been mentioned in the panel that the next stage is to look for human infrastructure, human capital formation. And I think that here within the Belt and Road Initiative, this people to people pillar is important and should not neglect Africa. Yes, uh, thanks for that, Joao. I totally agree with the people, the people pillar. Um, I mean, China's infrastructure investment in Africa, I think, is, is definitely necessary on that point because we need to see that infrastructure built up so that African nations can better export to the world, can better support trade uh, with other countries. And in terms of balanced trade, um, I, I don't think we should worry about that from a personal perspective because China does have, in terms of a longer term horizon, this country is focused on domestic demand. We see that from the highest levels of government in terms of really building out domestic demand under uh, the 14th five-year plan and China's dual circulation uh, initiative. So in terms of strong, robust Chinese consumers, they'll definitely be supporting businesses 
from all around the world. Um, let me bring it back to the digitalization of transportation real quick, because Mr. Besanov, you've done a lot on this front, a lot of research on this front. How do you see the digitalization of transportation really contributing to connectivity between uh, Europe and Asia? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'd like to add something. I completely agree with my colleagues. And I'd like to add something or K trains in transportation, um, uh, what we observe uh, right now. Uh, it's um, some in other majors more uh, than uh, only uh, development of uh, creation uh, infrastructure and uh, to create uh, the good condition for transportation. That are automation, enforced accessibility, digitalization, integration, and sustainability. That actually means that digi uh, digitalization is a must for the future development of connectivity. It is a tool to ensure non-physical reliability of transportation. Many countries are already in this trend. A national logistic ecosystem uh, is created in China and linked to Japan, to the uh, Republic of Korea. Eurasian Economic Union is developing digital transportation, uh, transport corridors. European Union funds numerous projects on digital integration. To be short, the role of the digitalization is crucial. Digitalization and conversion of transport corridors to trusted network at all levels could surely be a way toward to more efficient connectivity, transportation and, eco uh, and economics. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you for that, um, Mr. Besanov. So uh, that's all very high level. I want to bring it back to the business perspective and get back to China Poly Group because Mr. Liu, like I mentioned, China Bali Group is um, very widespread in terms of your global footprint businesses in over 100 countries. So how did your company use the scale? How did your company use your competitive advantages to make sure that we kept trade flowing, unimpeded trade uh, from the disruptions of COVID-19? Okay, that's a very good question raised by the moderator. It's a question of pragmatic relevance. Oh, as a member of social organization against the great upheaval in the society, how do we make sure that we can sustain economic development and make contribution to societal progress? And I believe this is one part of obligations. Looking ahead into the future, with the optics of BRI, the public group will surely make sure that we have a contribution in the building areas, for example, trades uh, development, as well as contribution to society. There are three key questions in our group. The first one is that we need to have more partners. We began as a trading company to a, a number 90, uh, 191 in the Fortune 500. We've been growing fast with nice quality, and we have been very much recognized and acknowledged on the front. The reason that Poly Group has been developing at such a breakneck speed is that fundamentally, we have a lot of partners. Namely, we have very large circle of friends. So to help poly further develop itself we have to make sure that we make better use of our advantages in terms of our business presence and business distribution to establish a larger circle of friends so we can have old friends and also we can expand into new friends so that this group will enlarge we surely make a contribution to societal development so i think that's one of our first takeaways in terms of using our existing strength in our businesses to establish a larger circle of friends I think Poly Group does not just belong to China, it is actually of global relevance. So namely, we need to have a group perspective, a global perspective. Well, second of all, over the years, based on our own experiences, Poly Group has been trying to seek reciprocity or win-win developments or all-win developments. So that would mean efforts should be made at the same time with different partners. Well, our early stage development has laid a solid foundation to help future growth. We have found the right channels. We have actually set the right benchmarks. Now with the new challenges posed by the pandemic and also with great transformation in the world. At the group level, we're actually seeing that 
as a company in the society, we really need to make sure that we make the best out of our, say, distribution channels. We make sure that the spillover effect can be felt uh, more cogently. In terms of the spillover effect of some of our distribution channel strength, we think that we should work more with enterprises, especially overseas enterprises, in some of our, say, strategic priorities, such as we work with them in our businesses, we work with government organizations and also NGOs or social organizations. Only by having these interactive channels can we make sure that our enterprises can develop in a way that facilitate trade, uh, facilitate trade flow and we can actually aim for an evergreen enterprise. So for the time being in Poly Group, we do have unique strength in a business structure. Besides our traditional business trajectories, we also have a light industry, uh, say civil explosive business, culture relic, culture relics, artworks, and also traditional real estate products. So our job is to see how we have synergy between these different segments to contribute to our growth as well as the development society. And that will be something that we have to value. No matter how we do it, at the end of the day, it's really about reaching an all-win destination. While in terms of the third philosophy, I think when we try to look into the future, we really need to make sure use of our brands, namely our branding efforts to enhance the branding heritage and mightiness so that it can be better recognized by the society. People will understand us in greater depth and vice versa, we're going to be offering our comprehensive support to the society. So I think in this regard, in terms of the culture industry, we should be introducing some of the well-renowned theater groups and theater companies from the international community. And also in China, we can support the theaters as well as cinema groups to actually uh, screen on some of the uh, outstanding artistic and theoretical products. So in that way, we can build poly into a poly with very nice cultural facade. And that will uh, surely lead us into a better position to face the coming dual situation. A bigger presence in Europe as well. And when it comes to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I'm wondering how the Belt and Road Initiative will interact with Europe now, because last year, uh, for the first time, China surpassed the United States as the largest trading partner of the European Union. Uh, there was also a China EU agreement on geographical indications, as well as signing that bilateral investment treaty, the comprehensive agreement on investment with CAI. So after all of this is done, uh, the two ends of the Eurasian continent seem to be coming together in terms of more areas of cooperation. How do you see the BRI then working under this umbrella to improve China-EU trade relations? First of all, uh, if you know it's trading in, in Europe, I very much work on contact with it will make you a good deal. Uh, I, I like getting negotiations started <laughs> on stage. How about we try and do that? That'll be interesting. <laughs> anyway. Um, but I think it's, it's very interesting. And I think um, we have been spoken, speaking about uh, imbalances uh, before. And I think it is correct. And I think it's very positive that uh, uh, China and, uh, and, and Europe, uh, uh, that China has become the largest uh, trading partner of Europe. But I think it's important that we also try to uh, unpack uh, the figures uh, a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I think when we, the statistics only look at trade in goods and not in, in uh, uh, trade in, in, in services. And I think if you combine trading goods and trade in, in services, bilateral trade between uh, Europe and United States, uh, it's about 40% higher than trade between Europe and, and, and China. To me, that says that there's a huge potential to continue to grow trade, also trading services between uh, China and Europe, because I think that's one area where we really need going forward to uh, uh, enhance uh, a collaboration and where I think today collaboration is nowhere uh, where, where it should be trading services. The other part is when you break down the figure, you can see that uh, Chinese exports to Europe is a, was about $385 billion last year, whereas Chinese, European exports to, to uh, China was only about $200 uh, billion uh, US dollars. So it, it's almost twice as big Chinese exports to Europe than the other way around. When you look at European exports to the United States, that was about $350 billion, and to the UK, $270 billion. And actually, China was only larger than Switzerland. 
so I think there is a huge uh, uh, um, uh, uh, imbalance in, 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 in that relationship. But to me, I think, first of all, that means that there is an opportunity. And I think also in line with what you said about dual circulation and the focus on boosting the domestic consumption could perhaps be an opportunity uh, for China and Europe uh, to further enhance uh, uh, bilateral trade and to ensure that uh, you know uh, it will be led by services, led also by Chinese imports that we continue to bring up uh, 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 that figure and create an even larger margin uh, down to number two in terms of European uh, uh, trade uh, relationships. I want to mention uh, Bell and Road was, was also uh, 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 part of the question. And I think the key lesson from, Bell, uh, from China, and which I think is the key concept in Bell and Road, that's that of connectivity. And I think the lesson from China is if you create the, the connectivity, then you also create conditions for trade. China went out and created the infrastructure in, in, in China, which enabled this very rapid growth in foreign trade and in bringing down the cost of uh, uh, logistics. And I don't see any reasons why you could not replicate a lot of these experiences that China has had in other countries uh, uh, also. So I think conceptually, Belt and Road is uh, definitely uh, on to, to, uh, to something right. We have seen on the rail how volumes are growing uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, right now. So I think both conceptually and what we see uh, uh, on the ground in rail, uh, 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 we see some uh, 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 real traction. But I'm sure that much more can be done. And you mentioned Africa yourself. There's still large part of the world that are not part of the global uh, 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 trade network. And I think that's perhaps where you're going to see the biggest benefits in the years to come uh, of uh, build and road connectivity uh, uh, initiatives. So, so again, real quick, um, what are your thoughts on the Chinese consumer, perhaps? Um, uh, oftentimes, we, we may think about China shipping products to Europe, but I mean, what about the potential of the Chinese consumer? What are you seeing on the ground in terms of demand here? I mean, uh, obviously, last year was a special year, but in terms of what we can expect for the Chinese consumer going forward? I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's a very good question, uh, but we have seen the emergence, of course, of a very uh, uh, rabid uh, of a, a very rapid emergence of a significant middle class. And I think where you perhaps see it, it most clearly right now, that is within uh, luxury good, where I think the projection is, I, let, I read yesterday, that by 2025, uh, China will account for 50% of the global market of, of, of luxury good. So it, 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 at least it tells me that the spending power uh, uh, yeah. is, is, is there. Uh, other areas where I think, the problem, of course, with luxury good diamonds and, and very expensive handbags and that, it doesn't move by shipping, it moves by air because of the value. So I would hope, of course, also that there would be other parts. But I think, for example, agriculture, I think when you look at the challenges China has uh, environmentally from agricultural production, the very, very large uh, population that China has, and also the desire of more and more Chinese people to change their diet, perhaps to animal uh, 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 protein, that would create big opportunities, for example, within agricultural export in, in, into China. And I think we see it already, but I would expect that to continue to grow. And I would think there are many, many segments, uh, uh, other segments also. Mm. Well, I mean, this is now the world's largest physical goods market, the world's largest consumer market for physical goods, China, uh, surpassed the United States, I believe in, in 2019 or 2020. And you have the world's largest middle class here, some 400 million strong. And the thing is, this middle class, even though it's the world's largest, is still growing, right? GDP per capita is still growing. Disposable incomes are still growing. So I think the potential of the Chinese consumer is really strong. And I see that when I go to malls, right, during, and especially during these online shopping festivals. So I'm really excited about the Chinese consumer uh, here. Professor Fei, let me get to you real quick in terms of Chinese demand, because I'm just thinking the, um, the China-Finland railway route, that opened, I believe, back in 26, uh, 2017. Are you able to provide a little bit more color for us in terms of the growth potential of, of rail connection between China and Finland? Because China really has a demand for high quality products right now. And Finland, I believe, is exporting a lot more agricultural products to China as well. So what are you seeing on the ground in terms of the growth potential of China-Finland trade through rail or any other perspectives you see on that front? 
Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, I think uh, with various interactions between uh, China and the European Union in recent times, uh, especially the China-EU um, Conference of Investment Agreement, um, and uh, also uh, the China-EU Agreement on Geographic Identifications, we see closer collaboration between the two countries. In terms of the areas that I think are sort of having the greatest potential, China right now is really concerned about trying to uh, be uh, more green. And Finland is a real leader in the world in green technologies. And I think this is one of the areas that we're gonna see a lot more uh, collaboration moving forward. I also think it's important to note that uh, China's really serious about opening up. And uh, these agreements I mentioned uh, show that. It's uh, interesting now that uh, you know with um, uh, the China-EU Geographic Indications Agreement, we're going to have um, you know, about 200 uh, well-known food agricultural brand names from Chinese and European countries uh, now recognized in both, uh, in both countries. And that's uh, going to be, I think, a big help. Uh, we also um, see uh, other things that are, are happening to make things uh, more fair for uh, European companies to enter into China. There are now more industries that one can have wholly owned subsidiaries. Uh, and uh, it's becoming more similar to competing against uh, Chinese companies. But I would also uh, say to my European uh, colleagues and governments that I've been a little bit concerned that uh, while it has been the EU countries that have been screaming, please make it fair in China, sometimes I don't see Chinese companies receiving the fair treatment they deserve uh, in Europe and the US. And I think this is an area, while it should be happening already because of the EU, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, trade agreement that uh, has our investment agreement that has uh, more scope for improvement. And I hope we'll see that uh, moving forward. Hmm. Uh, and speaking of opening up, so China's policy on opening up is that China's doors will uh, be more and, op more and more open to the wider world. And from a business perspective, uh, Mr. Liu, I want to get back to you in terms of looking ahead, how will you think China Poly Group, uh, what measures will it take to really promote as much unimpeded trade, I would say, as possible along Belt and Road countries. Looking into the future, Holy Group Corporation will have very steady and sustainable development path. I have said it again and again, Holy Group is one of the basic structures of the society. So I believe if we can do our job well enough, then we can serve society. Secondly, we want to exert our own advantage. We have had very good and sustainable development in the last few years as a result of the supports and help from different, uh, from organizations and institutions from different sectors. And also it is a result of a very good and favorable macroeconomic environment. We have had programs and projects in over 110 countries in the world. The layout of the market, the system of the economy will be two other driving forces for us in the future. As many foreign companies Poly Group is also thinking about how to contribute to the society. We want to strike a balance between the economic gains of the company as well as the social responsibilities. Uh, we are looking forward to cooperating with you, with your support. I believe China Poly Group Corporation will develop in a healthier, sustainable way. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're a bit short on time. I want to open it up to uh, the audience real quick, but one final question uh, from our panelists on this, if I may. In terms of uh, China is building a number of pilot free trade zones. These are becoming more and more mature by the day. I'm wondering how China's free trade zones, these pilot free trade zones, um, under the BRI can promote more trade uh, around the world. Does anybody want to take a crack at that question? How about Jens? I mean, it seems like you're the perfect uh, panelists to answer this question. What do you think about free trade zones in China? How does that fit into the overall BRI picture and how does that promote trade? I think, uh, I think uh, uh, historically it's uh, very hard to uh, 
uh, to overestimate the uh, importance of uh, free trade zones. Uh, I mean, I think you had the uh, the very first one in, in Shenzhen when that, that's opened up. And I think that a lot of these free trade zones has really served as laboratories for initiatives and policies that later on, if they succeeded, had become models for nationwide uh, uh, implementation. I think it allows China to experiment with certain policy uh, 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 measures in a controlled in, in, in environment to see how that actually works. And, and, and I think historically we have seen uh, a lot of these learnings have actually served uh, as inspiration uh, for policies that, that, that have you know, promoted uh, further uh, opening up and uh, integration uh, 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 with, with the world. I think it's, um, it has been historically uh, indispensable uh, in China and I think also uh, going forward, there is a definite and, and very important role uh, uh, for these uh, to play. And I know that in many places, for example, in, uh, in, in Shanghai, but certainly also here in Hainan, there are very ambitious plans to try to experiment with very, very, for example, tax uh, uh, incentives, free trade uh, uh, port uh, 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 policies to see uh, how that will affect uh, uh, trade and commercial uh, en environments. And it's something we are following uh, uh, very, very, very closely. Also because there is a track record over the past 50 years of, of seeing how experiences there are being translated in uh, to broaden uh, nationwide policies. Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you. Let me open it up to the floor. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand, state your name and organization and briefly ask a question. That gentleman over there, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for the um, uh, for your words from the, all the panelists on uh, on the floor. I, I want to put two easy, uh, easier questions forward to all of you, and also the, the friends on the on the screen from uh, the European side. Uh, one is uh, I, I'm from the the Academy of International Studies of, of Beijing. Uh, my first question is: uh, How do you see uh, the or, or uh, what we can do to put the bilateral uh, Sino-European investment tr treaty into effect? Now, it's uh, for uh, for the well-known reasons. Now, the the process now is uh, interrupted. Uh, another one is: How do you see the Russian effect when it comes to uh, to think about the connectivity uh, across the Euro Asia continent uh, because there is a great uh, vast of uh, juncture between China and the European um, under the um, uh, influence of Russia or Euro Asia Economic uh, Union. Many thanks to all of you. Okay, uh, Mr. Pesnov, I think you can definitely answer the uh, the Russia question in terms of how Russia fits into the bigger picture uh, in all of this, and then we'll get to the um, the CAI, the investment treaty between China and Europe, in a second. But Mr. Pesnov, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for your your very interesting questions. Relations between China and Russia grows every year rapidly, and I think. Uh, it is a very good perspective to increase transportation between China and uh, Europe. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, so uh, transit uh, from China to Europe increase every year, uh, and uh, only this year it increased of the 70 percent. We expect the number of uh, transit container flows from China to Europe will increase on the future too. We made a lot of efforts to uh, uh, develop our infrastructure and I think uh, we have a good perspective to collaborate with our colleagues to create new conditions uh, in a, a low system and automatic system and it gives us a, a very good opportunity to dramatically increase 
our cooperation. I think um, uh, we have a good platform of cooperation and it um, way for uh, two parts. And uh, I think we should um, uh, equalize our efforts in this way. And I hope everything will be done in the near future. Thank okay. you. Thank you for that, Mr. Pesanov. Uh, yes, I've got to come back to you on this again, because you're also the vice president of the EU Chamber um, of Commerce here in China. So uh, you've done a lot of uh, findings and studies on the CAI outlook ahead for this bilateral investment treaty. Yeah, I think, um, as you alluded to also uh, 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 in, in, in the question, that it has not been, um, uh, we were all, uh, uh, Glad to note that the two sides made an agreement towards the end of, of, of this year, and, and then we have seen that political differences uh, have sort of uh, created issues that could make uh, an early ratification uh, uh, difficult to achieve. And I think uh, it is something that we in the EU Chamber of Commerce see perhaps as a, as a worrying tendency that uh, a trade uh, sometimes becomes uh, politicized and that political differences have a spillover into the uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, arena. It's something that uh, we think is a great pity. It's something that we think is uh, 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 unnecessary. Uh, and we hope that uh, both sides will be conscious of the, um, be, 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 conscious, be, be conscious of the necessity to try to step back sometimes and, and look at, at the big bigger uh, a picture to avoid that that the business is becoming uh, collateral uh, damage in uh, in some of these uh, situations. I think uh, you know negotiations has been uh, uh, seven years on the way for the uh, CIA uh, CAI, and uh, uh, our our hope is that irrespective of the current differences, that it will be possible for the two sides uh, uh, to find some sort of common common uh, ground and proceed mm. to to ratification. But I think right now it's any, anybody's guess. But I think we should insist on that trade is actually one of those areas where it's possible to have constructive, friendly, productive, uh, uh, mutually beneficial links irrespective of whatever ideological differences that, mm. uh, that you may have. And I think we actually, as businesses, have a, a role in making sure that, that, that we can continue uh, building on these, by and large, very positive relations. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I absolutely agree, because again, behind those trade numbers, their families, their businesses, their good paying jobs. And I think from a personal perspective, I'm rather optimistic about this bilateral investment treaty going forward because China and the EU has, I think has a good track record in terms of managing differences, uh, especially for example, on climate, on, on green development cooperation. So I think definitely the two sides can draw on their experiences of managing differences and focusing more on cooperation. And Joel, you had your hand up, you wanted to add something to this, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just uh, to share your optimism, uh, I think it's very important that we consider that this agreement has not stopped. Uh, first of all, there will be a ratification process. We know that, we've all known that. Uh, at the time of uh, 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 shaking hands, uh, Germany was there because Germany was chairing the EU. Uh, but President Macron from France was there as well. And uh, foreseeably, the time of ratification or final ratification will happen under uh, France's uh, presidency of the EU. Again, President Macron. Uh, Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Macron are said to be willing to visit uh, uh, China together in September. So there is a sense of continuity within the EU. Michael, you were mentioning very rightly, very aptly, the negotiations on climate. The EU, unlike the US, does not want to, at the same time, discuss positively on climate and lead to rivalry on all other topics. Uh, the EU does not have this approach. It has a more positive approach. Uh, one very last, so, so really, this agreement is not dead. And on the long term, I'm pretty convinced it will click. Uh, very last and short point, uh, I, I really vouch for what all Jens has said, especially in terms of connectivity. The, the trade of tomorrow is on new schemes, on new energies, on new topics, on new technologies, and they all go through connectivity. 
Europe as a whole, even beyond the EU, formal EU, has much more connectivity today because it has invested in its own uh, infrastructure than the US has. So the interest for Asia to trade with EU and to balance the EU, to trade with EU is very clear uh, according to me. And the key issue again is, is today to have the right investments today. My very, very, very last point, uh, back to what uh, Liu Hualong said, uh, investment is based on trust and also goes through networks and culture. Uh, the two parts of the Eurasian continent has to get acquainted to each other better, have to know each other better. And uh, once the great treaties are signed, the contents can only be filled by the business and the businesses have to know each other and culture can play a very great role. Not culture in the generic terms, but culture in terms of cultural projects, cultural products. Mm. Uh, Jens, you wanted to add something real quick. Yeah, real quick, just, Jeff. Just, just very quick, and that's uh, related to, to climate change as possibly the largest challenge of uh, humankind. That is one area where cooperation is absolutely uh, 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 crucial. We cannot have a situation where China and Europe or China and the West begin to develop different technologies, different standards, we emerged has the ambition to become carbon neutral by 2050. Europe will be carbon neutral by 2050, China by 2060. If we do not agree on, on same standards, if we do not cooperate on technology development, it will be absolutely impossible in any conceivable way to, mm. to, to reach, reach the target. So I think here is one concrete area where we must insist on their collaboration. Okay, and I totally agree with what you just said. And the BRI has a strong green component now in terms of sustainable development for Belt and Road countries. Um, the lady in the third row, the Sampai, what the bend the Sampai, uh, Venti, okay, share microphone. I'm, I'm from CCT Russian channel. I have two questions for Mr. Gennady Besnov. Over to you. Yeah, I understand. So, uh, um, we have very sustainable, um, uh, different kind of international uh, marshals, and we will develop our opportunity uh, on the uh, west part of the Russia. I mean, uh, our border crossing uh, through Vladivostok, through Zabaykalsk, uh, through Naushki. I mean, the maršrute uh, from uh, China to uh, uh, Mongolia and uh, then to Russia. Uh, we have very significant result uh, on um, international corridor which goes uh, through China, Kazakhstan and Europe. And uh, we have a new opportunity to uh, put uh, part of the uh, cargo volumes uh, to the Russian and uh, some uh, uh, Russian ports and the ports of Finland to move cargo not only by uh, rail and uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, join a different kind of, of multimodal system which will able to increase additional volume uh, cargo which goes through China to Europe. Um, you should um, know that only one figure. Five years ago, the whole number of transit cargo which go which went from china to europe was around 60 thousand 60 thousand last year it was around 600 thousand containers we have planned to increase such number to 1 million 
and it's really uh, for all our participants of the international corridors. I have very good and bright perspective uh, to uh, increase our cooperation and uh, we should make some measures to uh, develop our cooperation of creation new infrastructure new technology and uh, i think uh, we have very good experience in this way thank you okay thank you for that mr Besnov. we are really short on time two minutes left i'm told not to run over time but that gentleman over there had his hand up so maybe one final question and then we're going to have to wrap it up. A specific question for Yins, uh, Shen Wang from China Reinsurance. You mentioned about the climate change and also decarbonization. And my question is to, uh, to you is for the shipping industry has been widely regarded as one of the verticals which is hard to decarbonize. And for the MERSC, what is your strategy to decarbonize in the next few years? Thank you. Uh, it's a very good question and uh, we have uh, come out and we have promised that we will be, be carbon neutral by, by 2050 and that means that our ships, all new ships we take, they need to be zero carbon by 2030 because they have a, a, a lifespan of, of, of 20 uh, years or so. We have actually first just ordered our, our first uh, carbon neutral uh, uh, vessel uh, uh, now. But it, it is a huge, huge uh, uh, challenge. Uh, and in many ways, the technology is, is uh, not uh, yet, there yet. Uh, so it's something that will take a lot of collaboration, a lot uh, of, of research, but it's something that we are firmly committed uh, to uh, achieve. We are right now uh, talking to uh, technical partners in Europe, in the United States, in China and Japan uh, to collaborate and try to create platforms for, for collaboration. So we, we can create that uh, um, uh, that, that technology that will enable decarbonization. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but I'm 100% I'm, I'm, I'm confident that, that, that we will uh, uh, achieve it. It will probably be a mix of uh, several uh, uh, solutions, depending on whether it's short sea or, or, or long sea uh, or, or, or long distances. Uh, for example, hydrogen could be a problem on longer distances because it takes up uh, more space there. Perhaps other fuels like ammonia or methanol could, could be uh, more convenient. So I think right now we are looking across uh, various uh, fuels. Uh, engine manufacturers are looking at how you can create new engines for these types of, of, of fuel. And then of course you also need to create a fuel uh, infrastructure. And that's back to my point before, that we really need to collaborate globally on this because you cannot have different technical standard. You cannot have different fuels in different ports because it's all internationally connected. But I think the positive thing here is wherever we go and talk to people, whether it's in China or in Europe or Japan and elsewhere, that's a huge commitment to collaborate in that. So I really think that this could be one of the areas where you see, you know, global collaboration uh, uh, moving forward positively. Yeah, so hopefully we'll see more green products moving between both ends of the Eurasian continent and around the Eurasian continent. Uh, Giuseppe, Final word to you, because ultimately it's about people. Your final word on people-to-people -people exchanges, mobility across the Eurasian continent. Thanks. I would like just to end. Perhaps, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, yeah. On a note on how innovation can help speed up trade again after the pandemic. Mm. Um, China has just rolled out its 14 five-year plan, and is a key enabler for a high-quality development. Now, in terms of people-to-people -people exchange, we often talk about investment in research and development. There is people behind it. Mm. And China has an invest on a great strategic interest in attracting and retaining talent. So the question is, how do we make this investment? You need businesses and the education sector to work very closely together so that whatever skills we develop today are going to meet the demands of tomorrow. Yeah. That also requires government to work alongside businesses, private sector, the education sector, to create the right policy environment for mm. that work. But because we are all talking and hoping that the economic recovery to COVID-19 response is going to be a better one, but also a fairer one, then it's also important to bring into the picture what the global compact on migration just adopted by China and most of the BFA member states um, two years ago calls for global skills mobility partnership mm. so that 
uh, the country that receives skills or talent, the country that sends it, and the migrant self set they can all benefit part of it. And that's my key message for the end. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for that final note. And with that, we're going to have to wrap up the session. I said spasiba uh, from our colleague from the Russian channel, CGTN. Uh, in Chinese, of course, to our panelists. Thank you. Uh, grazie in Italian. The French, it's, uh, oh, Joel left us, but I guess merci beaucoup. I don't know how to say thank you in Finnish. Professor Faye, do you know, do you know how to say thank you in Finnish? Kidos. Someone from the <laughs> panel said kidos. And then in Danish, Jens, how about you wrap us off in terms of tak, tak. Okay, so this is what I love about the Belt and Road Initiative because it can bring so many countries together from all around the world, from around the Eurasian continent. I hope I provoke, well, we, we hope we provoke some thought uh, for our audience here and around the world listening on to this session. So thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your time here in beautiful Hainan. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for your